one of the side topic, and I'll quickly go into this actual main topic. One of the things I actually really do care about is distributed teams as well. So all the stuff I've talked about when we're talking about the Mozilla portion in this here, note that that's a team of 18 people in 14 cities in four non-adjacent time zones with the highest retention in the company. I'll put that out there and just let you think about that. Okay. So um, force multiplier. Uh, let's see. So Mozilla actually was my first open source company that I was at. Um, I'm now at Hortonworks as of a few months ago. There's another open source company. And um, I've been doing the same sort of stuff in other companies, but always under NDA. So this is really the first couple of times I'm able to talk about this stuff publicly. And I do actually think that this is uh, generic. It's not specific to the open source business. So those are the two kind of quick intro topics. And you're right. You pronounce my surname as if there was no U for a bunch of Gaelic grammar reasons. Um, force multiplier. I uh, love looking up dictionary. And those of you who don't play board games should leave. But um, this is what the military says. They actually care about force multipliers a lot. Right? So the capability, whether it's tactics, equipment, or training, that employed in a combat force increases the combat capability and the potential to succeed. Right. That's actually a very kind of dry sounding. That's the way the military define it. And they put a lot of effort into this because they care about this. Right? That's why they go buy fancier weapons and do better training. Smaller teams can take on bigger armies, that kind of thing. I think that sort of applies here for us. Why release engineering specifically? I actually think, and I'm speaking as a computer science graduate, post-grad and all that, um, having been a developer for years, I actually switched over to being a release engineer. I actually think they're very different breeds of people. Um, so I actually, the way I could best summarize it is I think developers actually like to build a product that a customer or an end user, someone will actually use. Release engineers, I think, actually build a pipeline for getting it from the developer to the end user. I don't think, in a kind of a cynical sense, you could say I don't think the release engineers really care about what went through that pipeline as long as it didn't break anything. But um, th there's a difference in mindset. This is about end result to a customer. This is about iteratively making things better and smoother and faster and more efficient. And there's a different headspace here. Companies actually live or die by this. If you can't ship code, or if every time you ship code it's garbage and breaks people, you're going to quickly not be a working company. So companies live or die by this. And I would therefore assert that release engineers make organizations effective. So I love measuring things because I'm an engineer, right? So here's some basic numbers. Things that release in, you know, try and measure these up. If you had to do an emergency release for a security fix, how long does it take you? If you can get that down from weeks to hours. Um, how long to ship a new feature? From one and a half years to six weeks. And that's a traumatic one and a half years, and this is a routinely boring six weeks. Um, how many active concurrent lines of code do you have from one and a half, because one wasn't really fully supported, to 42? We could add more if we wanted it. And how many de developer check-ins could happen per day? Right? It was averaging about 15 a day. Routine, like the bottom line now is 400. The spike highest was 613 in one 24-hour period. What's that mean in terms of value? Well, that, this is where it gets interesting. It depends on who you ask, right? So um, I'm going to go into what I call fixing the pipeline. This is going to describe what I think is actually value. And specifically, this is, if I could like do a little implant in the the one thing I think people could do better at in the business is explaining why release engineering matters to someone who doesn't care about release engineering. They care about the company. So I'm going to tr try to mash those two languages together here. So, and I will also, uh, Guy Kawasaki does this great thing, read numbers, all the slides. I'm doing the same thing here. So you know how far you have to survive through till the end if you don't like this, OK? <laughs> um, so thank you, Guy. Uh, let's see, first, people. Engineers want to jump in and start writing code right away. I explicitly stepped back and I was like, 
well, before I get into like writing code for anything, what am I actually trying to solve and who am I trying to solve it for? Started off doing some of this and also kept doing it. So instead of just, just asking developers, I went around and asked the founders of the company, CXO level people, VP of engineering, like VP of marketing. What's the chief finance officer say? What's the head of sales say? So these are people who normally don't get release engineers walking in the door saying, hey, uh, what do you need from release engineering, right? So that's number one. Number two is I didn't walk in and say, what do you need from release engineering? Because if you ask that, the answer is always faster builds, right? That's just what people go to because they've been sort of by career trained to ask, answer that to that question, right? So I asked these questions. These are deliberately open-ended questions and explicitly don't mention the word release engineering anywhere. So what I'm trying to do is get people to think about if things could be better in the, how the company works, what would you like? What would make a difference? Uh, oh, and I would actually go and talk to developers in QA. I had to add that in case anyone got upset and thought I wasn't doing that too. Because um, these guys are actually working the front lines. They live and die by this stuff. You want to hear what comes from here as well. And every one of these people here have a different slant. So when you ask the chief marketing officer, you're going to get a different answer to when you ask the CFO to when you ask VP of engineering. Okay, they all care about the company, but they all have different slants and angles. So they may or may, or may not care about a given project that's in progress right now, but they all care about the company. That's one part. So here's some examples of things they do care about that I heard I thought people might be, find interesting. Just to give you some samples, and of course your mileage will vary in your own company, but you, I expect you get something like this in yours. So a commercial, you know, making money, right? If your company doesn't make money, at some point your company is not going to be there. So here's one example. So I'm at a company now called Hortonworks, and what Hortonworks does is provide commercial, OMG, it broke, I need to call someone and they'll fix it, commercial support for an open source product called Hadoop. Okay, we get used by a lot of big companies and when things go dark, they're not happy and they want it fixed pretty fast, right? Um, providing that requires some tricky release engineering because it's all open source. So providing super fast SLAs in terms of production outage support in an open source way turns into some interesting release engineering mechanics and how do you make sure that all the code is merged back in public if there's a hot fix that gets dropped in. And by the way, like that was a nice little Apache and in in-house, but then this is for each component, for each active supported line, for each of the operating systems that we support. But you can actually make a company be profitable in this business. So that's a value. The other thing that all these VPs and C-level people care about is anything that would threaten the company, right? It's the same sort of thing. What could possibly go wrong? So one of them is fallout from a bad release, right? If you ship a release and it totally borks everything, you're going to hear about it, right? First of all, you're going to lose customers. It took you a lot of time and effort to get those customers. And, then, and you have also damaged your company reputation. That's going to cost a lot to fix. So some quick examples of steps that can be done to mitigate that. So for example, at Mozilla, we would avoid putting out a release of Firefox on or a couple of days before tax day. Because you don't want to have suddenly people complaining that they couldn't do their taxes because they couldn't do an online tax filing because of a recently discovered problem. Right? Simple, so we avoid Microsoft Patch Tuesday. Hopefully there's nobody from Microsoft in the room. But we avoid that because it may or may not break things, but we don't want to be involved in the calculation. We'll wait a few days. Um, and then we do a thing called throttled updates I'll talk about later. Um, so that's a Mozilla one. This is another one of my favorite um, risk mitigation uh, stories. Uh, NASA Mars rover, you know, the big seven minutes of doom or terror, whatever that video was. Um, NASA does software updates, right? They did an update for this thing in November 2013 after it was on the ground for a year, they were doing an upgrade, which was actually great that you can do an upgrade onto a hardware system on another planet, and the system wouldn't reboot. So for five days, it was offline until they figured out a way to, to get it to revert back. But had they not been able to get it to revert back, it would have cost them $2.5 billion. 
not to mention someone's career, at least one person's career, and international prestige, and what's your chances of getting budget for another large robot if you just left one sitting in the dust on another planet. So these are the kind of costs that go with any kind of screw-ups. Um, if you have a security problem, how fast can you fix it? This comes up in a lot of different ways. This turns into negative press coverage. The last thing you want is to wake up in the morning and find that the German government has told all of your German users to stop using your product. This is bad press, as they say. Um, <clears throat> I'm not making this up. So uh, this here, uh, this happened in January 2010. Uh, Microsoft IE had an exploit. The German government made an announcement saying, hey, all Microsoft people, you should, st or Microsoft IE people, you should stop using IE in Germany, you should switch to Firefox. This here is a chart of our increase in load in the Mozilla download site of IE users from Germany with that German announcement from the German government. So these are all, to someone in Microsoft, this is Microsoft users leaving by the day. I don't have, but I'm imagining there was something similar when the same announcement was made about Mozilla a few months later. Microsoft doesn't publish that. Or, um, I note that one of the things we did in this, which we'll cover here in this session, um, meant that we've never had another announcement like that since we changed the release engineering process. That was in 2010. In case you thought that a press release would help cover up, you can buy a full page ad in these things. They will run you anywhere from 170 to $210,000 per day for a one page ad. So you can buy a lot of machinery for that kind of price and one page ad doesn't get you much. Um, buggy software, I'll come back to that, but actually this is gonna be important, so mental note that. Feature wars, if you're the last product, this is my favorite example here, WebM was this whole video encoding standard thing as a competitor to H.264, for those of you who are into video Kodak stuff. Um, so uh, Opera, Mozilla, and uh, Google, actually, got on the stage together at uh, Google I.O. in uh, June 2010, all co-announcing, co-developed, co-standard, here's a beta version of this WebM standard built into all the browsers. Everyone loved it, great press hoopla. Then we had to just ship a release. Opera shipped the next month. Google shipped three months after that. Mozilla came in six months after everybody else. The code had not changed for the WebM stuff. There was just no other release vehicle that Mozilla could ship out on. The rest of the product was too unstable to actually ship out WebM. So we actually came out as one of the co-originators of this spec. We shipped nine months last. And here's another thing. We, uh, at Mozilla would do this uh, customized version of the browser. So you could actually make money by having people say, hey, we're the, not a real example, American Kennel Club. We'd like an American Kennel Club browser. And so people would actually pay for the builds and the supports and the customized links and stuff like that. Those are being turned away because we didn't have the ability to keep doing them. Now we actually do a couple of hundred of them. So that makes us money. And this is another one, infrastructure limits. Could you actually hire more developers and actually have them work? Um, there's a few versions of this. One of them is the, hey, you know, congrats if you're a very small company. Congrats, you've just been funded. Um, or you bought a company, or as happened in the case of Mozilla, they're turning around and growing fast. So how well is your infrastructure handling it, and could, how well could you handle growth? Could you handle hiring 5% more people, or 50, or an order of magnitude? In the six years that I was here, um, we went from a total population in the company of about 90-something to 990. And we stayed in that you know, 70, 80% engineering range. So that's, that's a lot of engineers, and the infrastructure had to stay working for that. Those are the things that every one of these people answered back on. Nobody cared about any of these words, which is a pity, because that's the words that we tend to say a lot. Right? 
They didn't care how I solved it. I could do it with voodoo as far as they're concerned. They just wanted to be able to keep hiring developers, not have bad press, ship quality product on time. So walk around and talk to all of your customers and keep doing it and focus on what I called company threatening problems. Don't go talking to the release engineer beside you and just between the two of you think this is the right thing to solve. Go talk to people who you would normally never think to talk about. That's people. Now keep talking to them. Now what do I mean by that? I had to actually find ways to make sure everyone understood what we were doing and how it was getting better. So uh, people don't expect me to fix things on day one. It's already been a hard problem. They know that. It's been hard for a long time. But now that I've been talking to people and I go off and I come back and talk to them every two, three, four weeks, they want to know that things are somehow improving. Um, the thing that's interesting here, so key performance indicators uh, are a way to make, keep track of, a simple way to keep track of are things getting better, measurably. Not just does it feel better, but like show me a number, right? Like those numbers I showed at the beginning. Um, but you want to choose carefully. People will optimize for whatever you choose. So if you say uh, key performance indicator is like number of closed bugs, people will close bugs like you wouldn't believe it. Whether or not the work is done is a separate topic. The bug's closed. Right? So watch for what you define as a metric. Be very careful with that. You Actually, if you're not careful, you can organize things to be worse by choosing the wrong metric. And then show progress because you actually want, this is a big problem for morale. This is a long haul complex project. You want to have people feel that they're actually going somewhere as opposed to just raging against the machine and not getting anywhere. Um, and keep it super, super, super simple. You want to be able to communicate to all different parts of the company who have all different backgrounds and careers and interests in five seconds. You want to be able to hear the front receptionist talking to somebody in customer support about the latest metric numbers and have them each understand it right? without you prompting them. Right? You got that, that. So uh, this also helps because then people start thinking, once they understand it, then they start thinking about what can they do to help. And this is actually a big <coughs> company culture change part. This is super important again. And again, this is not technology in the sense of you know, writing code. This is about explaining how things get done. So quick examples, uh, we started measuring, everyone, I said, well, let's measure how long it takes to do a release. And everyone's like, oh, well, we need to have all these like, log splitting analysis. Like, F that, OK, we're just going to measure timestamps on emails. Right? That's, I know it's not accurate to within a microsecond, but it's within a number of minutes. I'm good enough with that, because we're measuring hours and weeks. Right? Um, the perception was, for the, when we did it for the first release, the perception was that release engineering from the time they said go to build to the time it shipped was 100% release engineering. Um, actually, the reality was it was less than 50% of the time was actually with release engineering. The perception had been that nobody else could do anything to help because it's all release engineering. This, when I actually showed it out, became interesting. So our first release that was actually calm enough to actually get these numbers it was six and a quarter days, of which two days were spent in release engineering. That was the first one I measured. And the numbers kept changing. As we kept shrinking them down, these ratios changed. But there was a lot of cross-group communication missing. There was a lot of lack of coordination, things like that. Um, and particularly decisions about, wait, yes, go ahead and ship it. Wait, 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 I think we found a problem. No, oh, actually, I was a false, false alert. Keep going. It was extraordinarily expensive. So if you've ever been in one of those stop, go, stop, go churn cycles, you know, there's nothing quite as frustrating as having spent two nights up burning away on something and someone comes running down and says, we found a showstopper, kill everything, we'll give you a new fix in 20 minutes, and you do kill everything. You're like, okay, let's scrub the boards and get it ready. And then they come back five minutes later saying, oh, sorry, false alarm. And you're like, well, I just killed everything because you just told me to. You know? so, this is an, became quickly apparent here. Um, and you know, we do not measure how long it takes a developer to code a fix. You do not want to encourage someone to beat the clock 
and write terrible code that turns into having to do another release later. Also, don't count open bugs. The number of times you have to rebuild, what you actually care about is from when it started to when it's in the hand of a customer, and then how many times do you end up doing releases? Like, do you have to do a release because something broke? OK, let's get it out the door now. How do we miss it? How do we make it better? Um, one example. The other thing we measured was number of check-ins. So this is actually not that hard to gather. You can write a code to grovel through your check-in logs, and, but then make it visible to the outside world. So this is for, this is actually November, so it's a bit old, but you can clearly see the weekends, people mostly having weekends. Um, and then time of day, which explains why, like middle of the week, middle of the day, has got a lot of heavy load on it. And we're just showing these numbers. People are like, oh, that's self-evident. Most people are asleep at night, except for the people in different time zones. And there's less of them than there are people. So people started to modify their behavior. People would start doing check-ins in the morning before they came into the office. And late in the evening, they start sharing out that. And also people started, different people started to work weekends. So, but at least making this visible to people. So people can see. This also explains to then when you go back into the VP of engineering and say, hey, I want to buy another couple of hundred machines, they know what these numbers are. If you get the machines, and you can say, look, now the numbers have gone up. Those machines were worth it. Do you want me to, can I get another couple of hundred? Because they can see that. Uh, here's a trend graph. This is from 2009. I've been there for a while by the time we got to start this. Um, and you can see the number, sorry, you can see the number of check-ins going up. Uh, here's where we lost uh, the database that didn't, wasn't being backed up that was tracking all this. So uh, this was the actual number reported for all the data we had, which was part of a month. And that's based on where it would have been if the numbers had consistently continued. Um, worth noting here, in that same time frame, yes, we hired more developers. So we had eight times the number of developers you would, at best case, hope for eight times the number of check-ins. Best case. We had 27 times the number of check-ins. The way I phrase this is that the rate of infrastructure improvement outpaced hiring. That is something that C-level people listen to. And the other one is just start. Right? It's very easy to sit there and draw this huge, big, complex whiteboard diagram of the way it should always be in a perfect world. And then you can't actually get from here to there. So just fix something. Like go home today and find something small that bugs you and fix it. I had a long line of people walking in the door telling me I should fix automated signing. I should fix how we do our updates, how we do all this kind of stuff. I was like, you know, I'm just going to start doing things like maybe doing a check for disk space before I start. Right? Because that's really simple fix and it saves me six hours of recovery work when I run out of disk space and, I, and the machine build fails halfway down. I'm like, oh. And it's frustrating because you know about it in advance, right? It's like, so just find something small and fix it and just start. And the other thing is actually be optimistic. And it sounds kind of hokey, but again, you know, the military care about this. Military will actually care about battlefield morale in a big way. They will actually pay people to fly into a battle zone to take you out of a battle zone and send you on vacation. It's called R&R. &R. And they have to send someone else in to cover for you while you're out on your vacation. Right? So morale is a big, big thing. If you're looking at a group that's burnt out and or is uh, kind of beaten down, you're gonna, your expectations on what people can and cannot do is definitely, definitely down. So focus on something that you can actually make better. It gives people hope that things are getting better. And therefore, you should stay trying. Just don't give up. Relentless baby steps is in, gives you great, great progress over time. Um, four, coordinator. Remember the stop, go, stop, go churn I was talking about earlier? Specifically said, OK, we're going to, before we start this release, I'm going to find a volunteer. And the first one was me, then it was a VP of engineering and somebody else. We eventually hired a full-time role for this, what I call a release coordinator, the person whose job was 
to be the final neutral arbitrator that said, yes, all the changes have landed, start the builds. Oops, we have a showstopper, halt. You know, that person. I wanted that person to be somebody who could make all the stop-go decisions in a neutral way. So that person had to be able to say, yeah, I understand the product. Yes, this is a real bug, but you know, only 5% of our users are on that, and they don't care about it that much, so we don't worry. They had to be able to neutrally say, I, this is in the best interest of the product. Uh, when I just did, did this the first time, what I was trying to do was reduce the stop-go, stop-go churn. Um, and what I didn't expect was people saying, oh, you're just saying it's not important to keep going because you're the release engineer guy and you don't want to have to do the work again. I was like, it's very, and when everyone's all hot and bothered at that point, it's very hard to have a rational conversation about, look, I'm trying to be neutral and do what's, I want to make sure, is it really a showstopper? Because if it is, we'll stop. You know, you get, so being a neutral person, separate, who is not a developer who cares about that piece of code, who is not a QA person who cares about that particular test, who is not a release engineer who may or may not have to do the work. Someone who is neutral and can make a call based on the product and the market. And they need to be clearly agreed in advance. And then if people come running down the corridor to me and say, hey, the build is, you know, we've got to stop, we have a showstopper, I'm like, go talk to the release coordinator. His phone number is, or her phone number is, I will not touch a single thing until they call me and they have my number. And the first thing they'll do is like, can you reproduce it on another clean machine? No. Okay, let's, let's invest, you know, everyone just calm down and try again, right? Um, this eliminated that whole false churn thing in one day. That was one big saving right away. And like, funny thing is, up to this point, people are saying releases also should be made faster by, let's buy newer machines that'll get us 10% improvement on build time, because it's all cool technology. I mean, this took days off the release cycle. And this doesn't involve any machines, right? This is a human organization. Um, part of also doing that was set up a cross-group mailing list. There was all these sub-lists of different groups that had ideas, and people would email each other side by side. But then you find people like, oh, we've decided to uh, stop the bills and go back and do a rebuild because of a problem. But no one told these other guys who are still working late at night, feverishly testing what they thought was the real still build. No one had told them to stop. That's also bad for morale. So um, this is where all stop-go decisions are. If there's an abort problem, everyone across all the companies sees this. Everything from marketing through to QE through to development leads, everyone. And if there's an emergency, it's kind of a little kind of boring most of the time. It's if there's an emergency release where we have to move fast for like a, the day after Black Hat kind of scenario, we use exactly the same thing. And people know the process because you do it all the time. So when you're doing it under tight timeline, people are very familiar with how it works. There's no frustration. If someone's out sick, someone else is covering, they all know how to do it. And by the way, you've got a very easy little folder of emails that tell you your timestamps for your postmortems. So um, that's that. So far, these haven't involved technology, right? These are just people stuff. Now we get into actually fixing problems. Um, this is the, you know, can we build a shiny new thing? Yes, it'd be nice if we could. The problem with building a whole shiny new empire is we have barely enough people to fix the problems that we have on our deck right now. How do you expect us to do all this amazing stuff elsewhere if we can't even keep the lights on? So I didn't, didn't think it was appropriate to even try going to build a shiny new castle and hire up a second team to do this. I was like, let's just fix what we have. Um, I also cynically didn't think that we actually could reproduce what we had in-house because no one knew exactly what all the hidden gotchas were. So where's the spec for the shiny new castle? And by the way, is this going to be the first project in software history that ships on time with no bugs? You know, so this is a big, to me it was like the only choice. It's like iterative development and improvement was the way to go. So I called it draining the swamp. And um, my, uh, I did two things here. One was, um, the first day after a release, when our memories were fresh on having done a release, I got an agreement from my boss that we would not have anybody come in and talk to us 
on that one day. I was like, the second day, fair game. The first day after release, we need a day to just fix something. If you have to, call me. Otherwise, we're in a room with the door closed, and we're just trying to like do things like, OK, what killed us the most? OK, let's put in disk checks on the you know, free disk space checks, that kind of thing. Or send us emails when a build finishes so we know to come back and do the next manual thing that we had to do by hand. That was a big, big, st good starting point. Um, and it di didn't really matter what we fixed. The important thing was that we fixed something in that day because there would be another release in a couple of weeks' time, and we wanted that to at least be fractionally better than what we'd just gone through. So make it better, slightly more robust, just stabilizing. Every one of these small things we fixed meant that the next release was a little bit better, which actually meant that when we did that one day of work the next time around, we actually had a little bit better. It kind of slightly raised the bar a bit. The first few of these didn't look like it was making any difference, but the curve started to go nicely up. You started to have longer and longer periods of uninterrupted time. You could start working on slightly more complex problems as you went. Um, and uh, yeah, we lost track of a uh, number of times we said, wait a minute, how did this ever work? Have we always shipped like this? This, is gotta be, this cannot be real. Um, so just expect that. And just as you find them, like every one of them, we file a bug. Like, oh, I can't believe we do this when we're signing. Like, no, 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 no. Fix it. You'll forget. You know, so file a bug. If you can't fix it immediately, come back to it. Um, every release gets slightly better. You need hope optimism. Otherwise, you won't keep doing this. You need to see progress. Q quote. Um, so I call this the draining the swamp. Um, what happened there? Oh, there. So once we got through the big draining the swamp part, and this is where we're fixing, now we start, you know, instead of dealing with just only small things, we started to have time to tackle a couple of major pieces. So this is the first of one of the major pieces that we tackled. So we used to, uh, those of you with long-term memory uh, around Tinderbox, anyone ever? Two, yeah, a couple of people nodding on, the, yes, good. Um, so uh, Mozilla was, I think, the first, although there's some discussion about maybe the second uh, continuous integration server in the world was called Tinderbox. And it was basically like a script that would just keep, it was just a loop, build all the time. Build finishes, go back, pull tip, build again. Build finishes, pull tip, build again. Which was you know, outstanding in 1998. Um, uh, I'm, I mean that. And it would look like this. So there would be one, like you want a Linux build, then you want a Linux 64-bit build, and these, these would just loop. Ding, 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 ding. It would finish and start, and then finish. And it was done by time. right? So this is human clock time here. And you had to match by human brain power time here well, this build started at this time. Look at that time. Now go to CDS. Find out what was in that commit. OK, now you can work backwards and say, OK, this build is passed and it had my change. But this build, wait a minute. What's, and this is different for, they all start at different times. So the start time for the Windows build and the Linux builds are different because they all have different run times. And they're all just completely constantly. Like when it finishes, it starts again. And so they quickly get out of sync with each other. So the act of looking at this, first of all, you should know that as Mozilla started to support other platforms, this became something like two and a half screens wide so to scroll back and forth. Um, and then secondly, the act of figuring out whose change broke something was actually really hard. Like you could have smart engineers looking at this going, no, wait, is my change in the broken build? I'm not sure. Let me just, did I do that? Wait, it's after me. That's before you. So it's some, you know. Um, we change that to build on check-in. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. This goes on even if there is not a check-in. It will keep building. So you can do a check-in Friday, and you come back Monday, and there would have been 25 builds in between. And you've got to figure out which of those failures are caused by human check-in versus intermittent network problems that just happened when there was no changes. So changing it to build on check-in meant a couple of things. First, no change, no build. That actually scared people for a while. They're like, wait, there's no builds. I'm like, yes, 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 that's right. There's no builds because no one did anything. So <laughs> you should be glad. Think of the electricity. Um, and the other thing was build and test per check-in. This makes it really easy to say, look, you're the only person who changed something. 
It's all red. I know you don't think you did it, but here is the evidence that everyone else is fine and you need to look at your code. Um, so we had to do something to rearrange the results. This is where user interface people are really good and I'm not. Um, this is uh, actually a volunteer contributor from Germany just surprised us one day and said, here, I've got this thing you could try and does this work? And we're like, oh, who are you? Come here. So this is, and I'm sorry, I tried to make this fit the screen so it's totally unreadable, but you can, this is a public site so you can just go and look at it, right? Um, please don't take down the network in the hotel. Um, so the way it works is it's organized, here's your human check-in name, so the person who made the developer change. Um, in this particular case, this particular guy, I happen to know because I was looking at it on my laptop when I could read it, um, this guy was taking a bunch of changes from another code branch and merging them in. So here's the list of all the commit messages with the links through to the actual change sets you can click on. So you can actually see, just by clicking on that change set, it'll take you right to the actual code that's in the patch that's in there. Any of these bug numbers, if you click on it, it takes you directly to the bug that's being fixed. And for that change, and that change only, each row here is an operating system. So there's 32 and 64 versions of Windows, Linux, and Mac, and a few different versions of Android. And then uh, Mozilla is now doing these Firefox OS phones. So there's a few different hardware-specific phone builds. So these are all the different operating system builds. And they start with a B for the build, and then there's the all the different test suites that get run. You can tell that this guy's got like a really, really high ratio of green. There's a couple of intermittent things and if you've got really good eyesight, you can see he's actually put an asterisk beside them, meaning that he's looked at him and it's human okay, it's clear to proceed. And he's all good. You can tell in an instant if he's good. And you can equally tell in an instant if he screwed up. This matters because if he screws up and does a check-in and goes home and someone else comes along and sees it all red, they are 100% confident that they can back out this loser guy because even when he's still driving, they don't have to wait and have a discussion with him. They're like, black and white evidence. You effed up. Out. Which means that the tree is quickly returned to a usable state so someone else can check in while this person figures out what went wrong. Right, build on check-in. We had to do build on check-in specifically as a prerequisite before we could do the next sort of not so baby step. Pools of machines. Um, we used to have 86 unique machines. So there was a Windows, a dedicated Windows 32-bit opt machine, a dedicated Windows 32-bit <laughs> debug machine. Yeah. Tick, 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 tick. So there's 86 of them. I, uh, they were all special snowflakes, each one of them hand-built. I used to think of them all as 86 single points of failure, because if any one of them went down, it was an OMG phone calls right away. No one could do anything, right? So this did not lend to, first of all, a quiet day at all. And secondly, it did not lend to doing good fixes, because if this thing is down and everyone's standing around yelling, if you can get it to at least light up again, you're like, oh, OK, that'll carry us through to the weekend, maybe. And I'll come back and fix it later, maybe. So then when it blows up again next week, you're like, God damn it. So um, I wanted to change it so when a machine dies, another identical machine would take over. The, the dead machine we could deal with in, an, in a non-stressful, non-production impacting way, while another machine kept going on with the production load. So one particular machine job, like a build or a test that was running on the machine when it failed, that would die out, but the rest would keep going. So we changed it to this. This actually has very few single points of failure. We've got a lot of machines. Uh, some of them are virtual. And we're shrinking and growing as well. I'll talk about this in a second, depending on load. But some are physical. But we don't care. If something blows up, release engineering get notified about it, because we're watching and not just alerting and a whole bunch of things. But developers don't see it. Customers don't see it. Um, of course. Oh, and the other thing is they're all set up with Puppet. There's no human touching anything here. It's just strictly out. So if you need to set up a new machine, that's fine. You don't need to touch it by hand. Right? Um, we had to arrange them. In a, that number of machines you don't put in one basket, because that's not a good idea. So we had some physical machines. They're spread across actually four internal colos that we have. I couldn't figure out how to draw them into this screen. 
which are connected by VPN to three different Amazon regions. So we can actually use, when we dynamically shrink and grow here, depending on load. And uh, these, they're physical. That's not so easy. I'll explain some of these in a second. Um, this means, oh, sorry. And this means while we, Amazon has occasionally lost a region, Amazon has never lost multiple regions, ever. I know, now, said, now, and sorry, everybody, if that happens tomorrow, I will. Yeah, I did. Um, so I, I was paranoid, and I set it up to run in three. I'm also very aware of the fact that you know I live and work in an earthquake zone. This is something I'm not used to from Ireland. And so this is something I feel like you should not put all your eggs in an earthquake zone, right? So I didn't say never. Um, physically, because I wanted to talk about some machines, this is the sort of thing we were dealing with in terms of like how do you do testing on some of the older G4 Macs and things like this. So you, things like this were all over the place. Um, there's usual gratuitous shots of racks of machines. And some of you guys have way more racks than this, but some of these are also interesting problems. Like how do you test performance on graphics on Macs? Well, if you organize them right, you can put four Macs into a one new shelf and put the power bricks in between. The newer Macs I love because they don't have power bricks built into them, so you don't even need those power bricks. And we would specifically put, uh, hang on, these little dongles with resistors on the right thing so it would not go into default resolution but would actually go pretending that there was a monitor there. You get a different resolution so you can actually do your performance testing. This kind of junk we need to figure out. Right? Nobody does this. No one in their right mind would do this. Um, but we have racks of these, like hundreds. So if you ever call up a Mac supplier and order a pallet of Mac minis, this is what it looks like. <laughs> um, the, uh, first of all, they called back going, what? And then the other thing was then uh, when they arrived in, the delivery people were like, what is this? Like, so they got used to these because we kept ordering them like this. Right? this is, there's no point in ordering them in less than you know, 100 or something. Um, <laughs> But you get into it, you quickly do develop a process for turning them out. Like, how do you deal with the boxes? How do you deal with the packaging? How do you deal with, on, you know, keeping track of the MAC addresses on the back of the MAC so you know which one to chase down and reboot, right? This is where you get into fun problems. Further fun problems. Um, uh, these are Android uh, NVIDIA Tegra 2. Point, sorry, Android 2.2 running on NVIDIA Tegra 250 boards. This is how we did our Android 2.2 testing. These had to be... Um, actually, we were first doing them on phones, which you could take out and reset when they crashed. And then you could do them on these, which were easier and cheaper. Um, these needed actual physical rocker switches on them, so you had to actually touch them. Um, so I needed to find, and this is high-tech, uh, bed, bath, and beyond, um, <laughs> wooden framed, because we wanted to make sure there's no metal interference with the wireless, wooden framed heat-resistant shoe racks. I'm serious. It's cheap, fast, and you can buy them. They thought I was nuts when I, bu I bought out the entire San Francisco Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> they were like, what kind of shoe guy are you? Anyway. <laughs> um, I, I will note as well that um, these you have to touch by hand. So these are Android 2.2. These ones here are uh, Panda running Android 4.0. These ones you can remotely re-image. You don't have to physically touch. So we came up with a chassis, and it's all open source. So you can go find it. And, but this is how we do our Android 4.0 testing. You put 11 boards into a box, and that's a 4U box. You put it into a data center, you never have to touch it again. One of them dies. Um, all of this scheduling that we just set up, so we could actually queue jobs, check-ins go into queues, queues go to masters. We had another machine, which I need to add here, which would actually let us add and remove masters as we were doing maintenance, and also track adding and removing of dead machines here. This is how we coordinated the actual builds, which would all get posted to here. We'd pull the builds from here to actually do the testing, publish the results out onto performance graphs and onto that TBPL thing that you saw there with all the green and red lettering. So from the developer point of view, they did a check-in and they looked here. This is the rest of it. That's a big baby step. That led to this one. Project branches. We've all heard like this, developing on one line, project branches. 
self-evident, if someone makes a mistake, stops everyone doing check-ins. Bad. Back them out. So project manager, someone makes a mistake, okay, you should, check, you should fix that. Work goes on here. Uh, at least you're not blocking all of development, even though that's still a bad thing. Right? You re reduce the company impact. You have increased the need for coordination. But you've reduced the risk to the company of a single mistake. So um, this we could turn on and set up for the company after and only after we had done this, the pools of machines. Because every one of these branches, no matter which branch you checked into, it would be run on these same identical hardware. So you'd be guaranteed the same results no matter what branch you landed on. The old model that they had originally started off was there were some machines dedicated to here and some machines dedicated to here. If it passed here, it didn't guarantee it would pass here because actually it was a different machine imaged a different way. So using identical machines for all of these pools was really, really important. So that's project branches. We started off and just set up a few of them to see if people would care. There's now 42. And we can add, like, the first five or six were actually tricky for us to have to, like, fill out all the edge cases. Then it got to the point where it was like, here's a text file. You want five more? You just go add more names, create more repos, and watch it inflate up. Um, and that actually had a nice side effect for release trains. And this is another one of these company things. If you're all on one track, the way I like to phrase it to make C-level people see it sit up is, like, your schedule is as predictable and accurate as the riskiest project. So I don't care what the riskiest project is, but you all in your minds when you're thinking about the thing you're working on, you're like, oh, well, this is easy, that's easy, and this one's really scary. Okay, That's the one that may cause you to have to miss your release. So I don't want that. Right? In theory, you can always back out the risky stuff. I've never seen that actually work, because as soon as you try to back out the risky stuff, something else breaks that was depending on that risky stuff. And now you're kind of double screwed. Like, it's not, not a good spot to be in. So um, project branches, if something's well organized, they get permission to land in, and they ship, and they ship on time. Risky projects just stay in the project branch and keep rolling. If they run late, if they hit a design, redesign, go back and do it again, I screwed up on something, it's fine. You go to the next release. Everything else ships. This has a couple of cultural problems. One, it's good for the company. You still ship something. I remember the whole WebM thing I described a few minutes ago, where I was like, we were the last company. WebM was ready to go. There was no way it could ship because of other things. That's a company problem. You have to fix that. The other thing is, um, there's a culture of people saying, oh, we're all working hard, we're working fast, it's a busy company, it's really tough to ship releases around here. Be because we all see that we're all having a hard time shipping releases. If you change that and say, hey, we're all working really hard and there's five development groups involved in this big push out the door and four of the development groups finished on time and shipped and the fifth development group is still late at night throwing pizza around the place and trying to get things working, at some point, that fifth group is going to look at the other four and go, how did they ship? It's not about the company. It's about us as a group are not organized right, or we didn't write the spec out, or we didn't define what our goals are, we didn't actually have this organized as a project. This actually has a Darwinian effect. Badly run, badly organized groups have people decide that they'd rather ship code in working well-organized groups, or they'll learn from the ones that are doing it well. This is a human culture change. But it's only really possible if people in the company can see other groups shipping successfully. If people can see nobody shipping, then they start thinking it's just, oh, well, this is just the way life is. It's really hard. It's when other people beside them are shipping just fine, then they start going, well, why can they ship and we can't? That's important. To do that, we set up more project branches. This is where some of those 42 are. So we actually have all these different project branches for all the different types of work. It's, they all come into an inbound, or what's called merging, and we have four, three of these now. Um, and from here, they'll merge into, this is the actual shipping, the main line. And this is the Mozilla-specific set of branch diagrams, but 
Um, Mozilla Central is their main trunk line. This is used by nightly users. So there's about 50 or so thousand people on this who are picking up bills every night. Every six weeks, we do a drop from here onto the Alpha or Aurora branch. So that goes to a wider population. It's a couple of hundred thousand people. And those, every six weeks, and they can get us, they give us crash results and feedback as well. Landing onto this is a tricky thing. You have to get a lot of approval to land here. You have to make another code change here. And you have to first land here, right? This is, as you go further down, the restrictions get higher and higher and higher. So here you can land some things. Six weeks later, it shows up here. Six weeks later, it'll show up on beta. This is a couple of million people now. And six weeks later, it'll show up in release. Now you're into 500 million. You do not want to F this up. Right. So there's a very high bar to entry. An emergency release fix going here has to have been pre-landed on all of these and gone through so much scrutiny, you will not believe it. Right? But the risk is high. So you do risk mitigation. But this you can only do when you have working project branches and pools of machines. But this means that you can ship every six weeks, every sixth Tuesday morning between 8 and 9 AM, they ship. It's routine and boring and always happens, unless it's a patch Tuesday. Then we defer it. Um, the thing about these branches, by the way, and these sync ups, these are the human checkpoints that we were talking about earlier. Depending on what's going on, of course, you measure this stuff, right? You can see where the check-ins happen. It's easy, so you make it visible. So people doing check-ins on these different branches make this visible. People are like, oh, this branch is too busy. There's too much stuff going on. Like, well, you know, there's all these other branches you can go on to. Like, oh, right, OK, I forgot. You know, and they stop complaining. And they go start working there instead. Very easy. Um, and of interest <coughs> here, which was the you know, main line or trunk line, this is under less than 5% of all check-ins. These are less than, like this is one, no, this is one, and this is one and a half percent, something like that. And it's pretty consistent over time. These ones up here, like they're all named after types of wood, so ash through to zebra, um, or walnut, I think it is. Um, they're all, they vary totally. So this chart here changes for those branches all the time, and that's normal, that's kind of, growing and shrinking of workload as people do different things. Lease trains. Baby steps, right? Relentless baby steps. Um, what else? Uh, we're nearly there. Th these two last things are things, I'm still going around and talking to people, like what are the things that they care about and what do they want from us? as I was doing this and showing all these charts. Just every month or so, I'd walk around and talk to people again. Um, two things came up, and I'm going to cover these quickly, because I'm not sure if they, how much they apply to people, but they're interesting. These two things came up as being things that people did explicitly did not think were even release engineering problems, even when it was initially explained to them. Updates. Remember the thing about uh, buggy software? It turns out when we did an analysis of the crash results of user crashes, many of the people were crashing on things that we had already fixed and already shipped a release for. The user just wasn't on it. So we actually spent some time working on two things. Um, one was making sure that updates actually always worked. It used to be updates were a post-release process, so you would do a release and have a press release and tell people, hey, existing Firefox users, go download a new Firefox. You know, what about a check for update? The thing was there, and it would be enabled about two months later when this other step was done. So like, no, no, no. Release engineering will make the update generation and verification be a release criteria. We're adding extra work to ourselves before the release so that come release day, we can actually ship and have release update available. Check for update work on the day. So a check for update should always, always work. If something, someone does it by hand, if a user has to go manually install, you're increasing the risk they're either going to mess up the user install or they're going to say, I'm going to try and install a competing product. So don't, don't go there. Right? Um, and the other thing was, uh, where, yes, when we do make this, we do what's called a throttle backup. So a throttle um, update. 
So manual check is where you actually go pull off the menu. This or idle time is where if you're just sitting with the browser running at some random time in a 24-hour day, the browser will ping back and say, hey, I'm on version X. Is there a new version for me? And you want to have this happen in a, in a kind of a low intrusive way when it's not interrupting when the user is doing anything to just see, is there a new version? And if there is, it'll download it, have the file there, and then put up a thing saying, hey, do you want to update? It's, avail it's available. It's already on the disk. It just needs to do the file swap. And to give, by Mozilla policy, give the user a choice about whether they want to do this or not. Um, but what you can do is you can also play safe. If you're not sure, you can throttle it to say only 1% of idle timer background checks will be told yes, there's an update. 99% will be told no, not yet. And so with that throttle setting, we can watch for crash results coming back and we can quickly figure out, oh, we missed something that's being caught in the wild that didn't get caught in our testing. Lock down updates totally, do a quick release, Post it up, unthrottle a bit more. Now do we fix it? Yeah, OK, now open the throttle out to 20%, now 50%. So users, most users never even knew that faulty release was out there because they didn't even get it. That helps in the perception because people don't see that as a problem. Also make it one click, come on. So here's a number. This is, these are some graphs showing uh, the, like within seven days is when I took this particular one. We had just put out this release and just unthrottled it two days before. So this is the number of users we had on a just unthrottled uh, release. And this was the number of users on the, like this is n, this is n minus one, the previous release. And look at the numbers on the, like it quickly goes into this long tail effect. And you'll always find some user way back on some, some of these are lockdown machines. Some of them are machines where you don't support the CPU anymore, and that's as far as they can go. So, so you always have this effect. But we get to over 85% of people within two weeks on the latest version. And that actually was all possible because of the updating. And that was specifically because we wanted to ch tackle this whole crashy problem. Um, the other thing was we wanted to hound. We found islands of people on old versions. And we would just like relentlessly like prompt them, like, you're on Firefox 6, please update, you know. Um, but we didn't want to keep bothering the people who are on like N minus 1, N minus 2. You know, they're kind of close enough to tip. They'll update in their own time. They've already shown good intent. So, uh, sorry, there's a better way to phrase that. But um, this is actually important for the, uh, in terms of not bothering the rest of the user base, but just the people we cared about moving on to the right thing and make the download size fast, small, as updates. Localization is the last one. Um, a lot of people do localize English first and then localize later. And in some cases, I've seen them do tier one, tier two, tier three. So like, maybe the most profitable languages come uh, two months later, and then the next one's a couple of months after that. The problem is you're then actually shipping different releases off of different code to different languages. Now if you need to do a fix, You've got a kind of a mess on your hand. Um, all locales ship off the same change set on the same day on all operating systems. That's a higher starting bar from a release engineering point of view, but it's massive gain in terms of ongoing maintenance and fixes. If you need to do a security fix, I don't need to go figure out what was the Mac Italian change set. And will my change on that branch work, or will I cause a problem? It's like, no, it's the one change goes in for all locales on all operating systems. But you have to get your plumbing right in the first place. Um, part of that was setting up nightly builds for localizers and updates. There's the gain. In six years, we jumped 60 locales. We ship in 94 locales and six operating systems every time. User base looks like this. This is ENUS, of which about half are on IP addresses outside the US. The internet is global, and the US is a, com is a country that's a third of a billion people-ish. The rest of the world is six and two-third billion. So that's localization. No one even thought that was us. There you go. That pipeline. That's what you guys do.
We have time for a couple of questions, but please use, I guess, either this mic or the mic in the back of the room. Hey, John. Uh, hey. Earlier, one of your slides about the release coordinator being neutral. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, how do you find someone neutral who's not QA, test, uh, uh, rel eng, or developer, who those people will all actually listen to and not just say, oh, that's just someone from HR <laughs> or, or, or something like that? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, it's not easy, is, this, is, the, is the quick answer. Uh, first off, it has to be someone who knows the business need. And it has to be someone who has enough technical chops that developers and QA will listen to them. Right? So you're looking for someone with an interesting mix of skills. Um, you're also looking for someone who will stay calm. Right? That is a, another criteria in there. Um, we started off, first of all, proving that the role was even needed by finding other people in the company to volunteer. Like I did it, and my boss did it, and some other people. Just to actually culture change set that people's company expectation would use this. Um, release coordinators, uh, I call them release coordinators because there's a lot of different people use different words like release manager, uh, program manager, uh, project manager, and they all have slightly different angles of meaning here. Uh, so to me, release coordinator, someone who can during the, release, during the cycle of development can be the person who says, you know what, feature X is really still too shaky. And they're meeting with the developers on feature X all the time. And they're like, you know, it's still too shaky. I think you should probably wait for the next go around and defer out. And it's only six weeks. Don't worry, we'll let you in on the next one. But let's stabilize these things. Um, so they have built up that trust with developers in advance of the go. Um, and then they have you constantly re-enable their power by, if anyone comes to you, you do not bypass. You go to them like, no, do you, you, you need to say. Um, it is a tricky role to find for though. I mean, you're, there's, I don't think there's such a thing as a release coordinator school. So you have to, you have to actually like look for people who have those kind of criteria and kind of eyeball to eyeball, do you think you can do it? Do you want to try it? You know, I, sorry, it's, that's the best answer I have, you know. One more. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of uh, developers everywhere for greatly reducing the number of versions we have to maintain of every software and every company and have to test against. So you greatly reduced our small firms, Java developers, uh, you know, amount of effort it took to maintain testing on 16 browser versions on 10 operating systems by just keeping at least uh, Firefox up to date. We only had to test on a couple of versions of Firefox that were, you know, well known. So. Oh. That, um, you know, it's hard to, this had a good compound effect for your company, mm -hmm. but I think across the internet, you must have saved millions of man hours. So, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, that, that was not just, um, thank you, although that was not just me. I redirect yes. that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But is it, no, it's a real, it's a good point, though. It's like, if there is, like, still a whole bunch of people on IE6, for example, just to take a hypothetical, that would never happen. Um, then you know you have you have to figure every company in the world that does on anything on the internet has to figure out how to support that. That's a that's an industry cost. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, John.